So, hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce this webinar on behalf of the Global SCAR Society. Actually, um, we are expecting people from at least more than 30 countries all over the world, and this is very fantastic that so many people are interested in SCARs and try to uh, help our patients to, to get over with the SCARs or to prevent them or to make them better. So, uh, we would thank you all if you let us know from where you are, and you can do this in the chat room. They say, oh, from Hong Kong already, <laughs> all over the world. And Brazil, very, very, fun, very nice. Eduardo, welcome. Welcome, Sina Günther from Switzerland. And so probably I will not be able to welcome everybody of you, but here's Netherlands, and we, we will update you on how many countries. Venezuela, fantastic. This is one of the advantages of webinars that uh, although we cannot meet in person, we at, real, at least have the chance to exchange our knowledge and for the best of our patients. Hi to UK, Amsterdam, NSC, this is oh fantastic. So, so many people from Brazil again, lots of people joining us. So welcome everybody. Um, the, uh, the webinar is um, gonna cover a couple of topics which are very relevant for scarring, for skin uh, replacement. Hello, Lucian from Romania. And uh, there is a possibility to ask questions and the speakers are going to answer them or in the Q&A session. You can write your questions into the YouTube chart. Uh, there's a chat room in YouTube that you probably can open and you can direct your, your questions and answers. Uh, we will answer them on the platform. We will gather these questions, your questions, and the speakers are going to answer them, hopefully all of the questions. Uh, so please put your questions into the chat and uh, let us know how we can answer them. Well, um, to make it short, there are very, is a list of fine and well-renowned speakers from experts in their field and uh, we are all looking forward to, to listen to the latest what's going on in tissue skin replacement, collagen skin substitutes, uh, about macrophage modulation and uh, all the uh, things that are going on and that are really important uh, how surgery, plastic surgery and other surgical fields will shape the future of scarring. So um, if uh, there are no questions at the moment, then we can go to Professor Esther Middlecope. She is uh, very well known for her excellent work in skin replacement, uh, tissue engineered uh, uh, skin substitutes and scarring. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce her now. She is from Amsterdam. I, I think I don't have to uh, recur on your CV because everybody knows you who's in the field. So Professor Ms. Middlecope, welcome. And I hand over to you, and we are really uh, looking forward to your talk on the skin substitutes. Thank you very much, Professor Orsch. Uh, let me uh, see if I can share my screen properly. Um, I don't see it yet. Let me try again. <laughs> Maybe Gabriel can give well, you a hand. Yeah, there's a small, small hiccup here. <laughs> uh, now this looks good. It's coming. Yeah, okay, here we go. Okay, okay. Here we go. Now I need to have a full screen. Uh, can somebody just quickly let me know if this is okay? <laughs> Oh, this looks good. Okay, you good. Your, your good. So, um, thank you very much for this nice introduction, Professor Horst. Welcome everybody to this uh, third Global Scar Society uh, webinar. And uh, I'm really happy that I was asked to uh, talk today about one of my favorite subjects, and that is the cellular skin substitutes. 
Uh, I would like to uh, make this statement that this, this is not a commercial webinar. Uh, we are looking at uh, subjects from a scientific point of view. Nevertheless, uh, some of our research is uh, sponsored, of course, by uh, different organizations, including companies uh, among that. A little bit of history. Why are cellular skin substitutes so important? Why could they offer uh, solutions for clinical problems? Uh, actually, this has been tried since the 1980s of last century already, starting with epidermal skin cultures. And some of these are still in clinical use today. Nevertheless, uh, very soon after introduction, uh, we became aware and that uh, there were several problems associated with um, epidermal skin cultures. These are cultures of only the top layer of the skin, only keratinocytes in a, in a layer. Uh, and what some of the problems are listed here. There was a poor take, there was blister formation after a prolonged time, after healing already, they, the, the sheets themselves were very fragile and they required really long culture times. And during the, uh, the years after that, um, we became aware that uh, the wound infection could be a major disaster for uh, take of these uh, epithelial cultures. And also uh, the anchoring fibrils were not properly uh, regenerated. And that is illustrated in this nice cartoon that I looked up on the internet, uh, stating that actually here in the... Um, uh, the layer between uh, the, the anchoring layer between epidermis and dermis, the basement membrane uh, of fibrils need to be reformed, the anchoring fibrils making the attachment be between epidermis and dermis. And that is actually the cause of this blister formation. So, how could that be repaired? And some of the really um, uh, giants in that time, uh, Professor Bell and Professor Janos and Burke in the US, they started working on the dermal substitutes. I'm not going to uh, reiterate that whole story, but actually we also started working on uh, dermal substitutes. And I have a small animation here that I hope you will be able to see. Uh, looking at the, the collagen uh, side of uh, which is the major protein in the, in the dermis of course of the skin and actually if you uh, would be able to regenerate also the dermal layer then uh, this problem of attachment of formation of anchoring fibers could probably be solved and actually uh, the quality of scarring the quality of healing would be much better. So um, we tried to um, uh, work along those lines and we started using dermal substitutes uh, when there were hardly any commercial products still available at that time. Uh, and we did that in a comparative clinical trial, treating one uh, hand of this particular patient with the standard of care treatment, which was um, excision and skin grafting. And the other hand was treated also with skin grafting, but underneath we placed this dermal substitute, uh, which is actually a collagen sponge. So we did that and we evaluated uh, the quality of healing and that was also still uh, at that time in its childhood, so we had to find new ways of uh, assessing the quality of a scar, uh, which we did by um, some technology that was actually introduced to me on one of the first meetings of the Global Scar Society, Avant La Lettre, the meeting in Montpellier of the Scar Club, as it was called at that time. Uh, so we compared uh, this particular treatment and then we looked at uh, so-called um, surface roughness by which you could quantify uh, the relief, uh, the, the bumpiness, you could say, of a scar. And then we noticed that uh, in using this double substitute, the bumpiness of the scar that was treated in that way was much less, uh, the surface of the scar was much smoother than that of the standard treatment. Nevertheless, uh, we were not completely satisfied yet with that result. And uh, actually, this is a list of uh, some of the dermal substitutes and epidermal substitutes and even the full skin substitutes that uh, are available since a number of years. So that is the development that um, uh, the whole field has seen 
uh, in, the, in the number of years after those initial trials. So now we have Integra, we have Natrida, we have uh, many others, um, and, uh, but they all still suffer from uh, similar problems. We still see a scar and we don't see full regeneration of the skin. So we need to think of ways how to improve that. And that brings me to the actual topic of today, the cellularized skin substitutes. Uh, some of the problems that are associated with using dermal substitute is the slow vascularization. There is still, during this vascularization period, a high risk of infection. And if we do see that, then there's a loss of beneficial effects. And one of the uh, things is, of course, that we still need a skin transplant as a epidermal coverage. So uh, potential solutions uh, might be uh, represented by adding growth factors or adding in particular uh, cells. Also, we could, of course, uh, try to adapt the material. But right now, for this afternoon, we will focus on the role of cells. So, of course, we need, for a full skin equivalent, we need a source for epidermal cells. We also need a dermal matrix and cells which can actually function as dermal cells. And over the years, we learned that um, that is not uh, something that uh, comes naturally. Uh, the, there is a great difference between fibroblasts, between the uh, dermal cells in the upper dermis or compared to uh, fibroblasts that are harvested from other, other sources like subcutaneous fat, for example. And here there's a rather old picture now that I took from uh, some of our experimental work on, uh, on animals. And this was a porcine wound model where we compared an acellular dermal substitute to a fibroblast seeded uh, substitute. And then you can, without going into all the details, you can appreciate that the quality of healing with the fibroblast was better than without. Uh, we did that again not so long ago uh, with, with a different uh, cell system, with a different model system, still in working in pigs. And then again, we found the same results. We compared it to other cell sources for uh, dermal fibroblasts. Uh, but ever, uh, the actual conclusion was that we could never beat uh, the autologous cell source, so the autologous source of dermal fibroblast. So how uh, should we go about if we want to use that um, in a clinical situation? Then we have to deal with regulatory issues, of course, and they, those are not to be taken lightly. Uh, if we want to use cultured cell construct, uh, then this is defined as an advanced therapy medicinal product. And uh, regulations come with that. Uh, and actually, it's not an easy thing to fulfill all these requirements as a hospital or as a clinician. So we need help in uh, official um, research institutes or official um, uh, facilities that can cope with that. Uh, to give you an impression, uh, cell culture uh, from a normal uh, flow uh, hood where you can uh, aseptically and antibacterially culture uh, cells for uh, research purposes uh, will move to the right uh, type of uh, image where you can see that now the, the person doing the cell culture is not only uh, fully dressed like uh, if it was COVID pandemic already, uh, but it is also situated in a clean room facility with very low levels of um, uh, microbial uh, burden. So um, nevertheless, we thought we uh, should go ahead and try to fulfill all these requirements. And my colleagues from the Free Medical Center helped a lot with that. So we decided to uh, try and um, uh, do a, a rather simple study with cell cultured uh, constructs. And this was uh, at that time still only uh, epidermal cells uh, that we wanted to use in combination with a widely expanded mesh graft uh, to try and improve the quality of healing for larger burns where we would need such widely expanded mesh grafts to cover uh, the burn. Um, and the setup was uh, is summarized on this slide. We had a skin biopsy of a couple of uh, square centimeters. 
this was transported at that time to the lab in the Free Medical Center in Amsterdam, uh, where they cultured the keratinocytes in, uh, within 14 days. And on the carrier, which was uh, matriderm, by the way, this was transported back to the clinic and there we applied it to uh, the uh, then debrided burn wound. And then we evaluated uh, the healing process uh, and also the scarring uh, quality uh, later on during the healing process. And what you can see here is that we were able to speed up the wound healing process in the initial phase. Uh, this was now six days postoperative post-operatively, you can see that in the experimental wound, which is here on the left, uh, the, the wound healing had advanced uh, definitely more than the standard of care treatment. But the main issue was, of course, the uh, quality of the scar later on. And that also uh, was better, and we could assess that also by uh, all kinds of um, scar assessment methods, and that uh, scar quality was better three months and also one year postoperatively. Uh, just an illustration of one of the parameters that we used, we measured uh, the redness and the pigmentation, in this case, of the scars, and there we found that uh, we could reach 20 to close to 40 percent of improvement uh, after one year uh, in color and pigmentation. And to illustrate that in a picture, uh, you see an example here where uh, in the upper panel you can see uh, the sheet that uh, is indicated here. Uh, and actually that same area uh, is markedly present here. And you can see that the color of this uh, particular scar is much more close to the normal skin of this particular patient. So uh, to summarize that work, uh, we could demonstrate that for these large uh, wounds, large and deep burn wounds, we could speed up the healing and actually that also led to uh, speeding up the scar quality. Uh, but of course, this was only the beginning of cell seeded constructs because then we came into contact with our friends in Zurich and you will hear later on much more about the, uh, uh, the adventure that the people in Zurich have um, achieved since then. And their idea was to culture not only uh, the epidermal cells, the keratinocytes, but also uh, the fibroblast. And that was actually the start of um, a new skin construct containing both fibroblast and keratinocytes. In the lab, they have gone much further since, and now they're also able to uh, include, for example, melanocytes and endothelial cells. Uh, but clinically, uh, the construct that uh, was developed as de novo skin uh, contains both keratinocytes and fibroblasts. So then we have a concept uh, which is very appealing, of course, um, uh, where we can replace not only the epidermal part of the skin, but also the dermal part. And we can do that with the patient's own cells and uh, culture skin from the dish. Um, this is actually something that has been tried for a number of years already and we should definitely acknowledge the uh, work from Stephen Boyce and his colleagues in the United States uh, where they have developed permaderm which is also an engineered full skin construct containing both keratinocytes and um, and fibroblast and on the right hand side you see a picture of de novo skin with also keratinocytes and fibroblast uh, which is now in clinical trial. So these developments uh, have been tried on patients and are actually feasible to use in the clinic. This is an example that I took from a publication from Stephen Boyce's paper. Uh, AG is the standard of care treatment and ESS is the engineered skin substitute, where you can also appreciate things that we have seen both in using dermal substitutes and in using the epidermal skin equivalent, uh, that the surface of these scars becomes much smoother than uh, with the standard of care. So this is an example from uh, the Zurich colleagues um, where uh, we will hear more about that in, uh, in a minute from Professor Schiesel, uh, where they have tried the skin substitute, the engine, the, the de novo skin construct uh, here on a deep burn wound. And actually this is a very remarkable 
good results. We have been lucky enough to uh, participate in this trial and I would like to share uh, some of our really early results uh, on that. This is a patient with uh, very extensive deep burns and uh, we applied a piece of de novo skin on this particular burn wound and compare it, uh, compared it to standard of care. And uh, I'd like to share this small video with you. Uh, where well, you can appreciate this is now the result one year after application of the de novo skin and uh, not only is the quality very good but it has also extended uh, way beyond their, uh, the original surface area that uh, was transplanted so it actually is able to, um, uh, to extend uh, significantly rather than contract uh, which is really special. Now, this is the team that did that. And of course, uh, this is now pre-COVID uh, times. And definitely, I would like to acknowledge the, uh, both the people from the clinic in the burn center, Beverwijk, as well as the lab team that helped in doing all the cell cultures and the, developing the cell culture techniques further. Uh, and with that, uh, that uh, ends my presentation for today. And I'm sure that Professor Schiesel will continue from here and, and uh, tell us his experiences about uh, this, uh, the clinical uh, application of cellular skin substitutes. Thanks for your attention. And we go back to, um, uh, to the studio of uh, GSCARS now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. It was a very fantastic lecture. and. Uh... I have, we have a little time for some uh, questions. If uh, we see some, I don't see that many questions right now. But I want to thank you so much for making it clear. It was very, very good to see the the way you, the very fine delineation of where it came from and how how it was influenced by surgeons to substitute the skin. Of course, as you said, we only had the the possibility to put the patient's own skin on, on a wound. And now it was fantastic what you showed within the last slides and, and your, your way, how you developed this. I have um, seen the whole list of um, temporary coverages or carriers that you showed. I remember there was a big hype maybe 20 years ago about the hyaluronic acid, like laser skin. I don't hear it any longer, although we, had, we, we did some experiments with it and it worked nice in the animal model. I have no clinical experience. Is it still? available or is it is a, a path that you follow where you say hyaluronic acid is associated with lesser scarring at like it was was the theory in the 90s yes that's a very good point actually to my knowledge uh, the hyaluronic acid based uh, uh, sheets are still commercially available my own experience with hyaluronic acid in this particular application, uh, we tested that really early on when we tried uh, this type of materials in, in a pig wound model. And what we found uh, experimentally is that hyaluronic acid strongly uh, induced vascularization and granulation tissue. So in, in furthering on from that perspective, I would guess that these um, materials would be specifically beneficial for uh, chronic wounds, uh, for rather inert wounds to actually um, try and speed up the healing process a little bit. Uh, we sort of left that particular area for, uh, for acute wounds and for burns, because in those cases, you would like to actually not induce so much granulation tissue. Uh, since we believe that that uh, would induce scarring rather than prevent it. So and, we and didn't I, follow that road. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, you would probably agree that one, one issue that you made clear is the time to heal is corresponding probably to the scarring, right? That was something I, I heard out of your, your um, let's say, investigations or your experience. Yes, yeah. The, that you say we need to close the wound as early as possible. Still, this is true today. It, it is definitely true. Nevertheless, uh, I should also point out that many of these uh, skin constructs uh, actually take a little bit longer time uh, for healing without actually um, uh, deteriorating the end results. There is a sort of a balance 
of course, in the, in the clinic, you would like to have uh, that wound closed as soon as possible because there is a danger uh, that there is a wound infection in the meantime. And, and if that is the case, then you would lose any beneficial effect of these skin constructs. Uh, but you can deal with a little bit of longer healing time um, if that healing process is rather controlled, if there's not too much inflammation going on. And then uh, actually the, you, can, you can accept a longer healing time without the scarring. That is so usually have, the result. Yeah. Have optimal preparation of the wound bed and take a little bit more time, but then have a better result. I don't see any more questions. So may I ask you one more thing? You talked about different fibroblasts, which is very interesting. It was always in the discussion that you need fibroblasts, as you have shown, together with keratinocytes and, and a, a carrier to make an optimal skin substitute. But how do you say different uh, fibroblasts? You said if they are collected from some other place, like from the dermis, they are behaving differently, is it right? Yes, what yes. Does it mean for mesenchymal stem cells? If you mm -hmm. Exactly, use. yeah. We had the, very early on also the idea that we could use mesenchymal stem cells to uh, uh, actually uh, populate these uh, dermal substitutes with fibroblasts and then uh, be able to, to transplant them pretty quickly to the, pa to the patient. What we found out in the meantime is that these cells in, in the type of environment that we have tested uh, are actually in many cases very pro-contractile, uh, which is especially for burn wounds, not very beneficial. So up to date, we have not found a trick yet to um, make these mesenchymal stem cells do what we would like them to do, and that is to uh, make a perfect new skin. <laughs> okay. So, Gabriel, how can we get to the other questions? Uh, we, will, we will do this after the next presentation, probably. So, thank you, Esther Middlecup, very, very much for this fine presentation. And uh, we are looking forward to a similar prominent speaker from the Kinderspital Zürich. He has been uh, active in, in pediatric surgery, plastic surgery, has written a book about pediatric plastic surgery and been in the, fire, in the burn treatment for long. And uh, I think everybody knows him. Clemens Schiestel, Professor Clemens Schiestel, we are looking forward and we have already seen a little bit a glance into what you are going to show us. Uh, so we look forward to your presentation. Welcome. Yes, so thank you very much. I, I don't know, I can't see. Do you see my presentation? Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you join in from all over the globe and it's a great pleasure for me to talk to you about expanding into the future. What I want to show you uh, today uh, is our adventure through, through the last 20 years of developing an epidermal dermal skin substitute. And before I want to start, I have to do uh, to, 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 to announce my conflict of interest, the Novo Skin and Zurich Skin. We call it still Zurich Skin because that was the name of the project. And it's still an expression how proud we are on Zurich, which is for us an idle, idle uh, surrounding to do this research, which we have done in the past. We, uh, the, the Novo Skin is produced by Kutis, a spin-off of the university, and I am five, uh, one of the five founders and shareholder as well. That is an official announcement. And now my private announcement, whenever we talk about Burns, there's someone who talk about, who present it, and there are a lot of people behind it. So I think everyone in the audience knows that Burns is uh, not a one-man show, and we have to uh, we have to uh, we have to have a team. I'm a little bit irritated because I can't see the pictures. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will have the pictures later on because that will be very very important. So, what I uh, I have divided my talk in in basics. In, uh, I will mention shortly the phase one and the phase two study uh, with the Novo Skin. And then, what's, which, which is very, very important, we did a large scale 
use of this innovative skin substitute in a first compassionate use case together with a team in the, at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham, together with both teams, it was a joint venture, and the second case of compassionate use at the University Hospital in Zurich, where I am, uh, where I am working. So the basic research was done over the last 20 years, mainly by Professor Reichmann and his team for the bio Tissue Biology Research Unit at the University Children's Hospital in cooperation with my team. The preclinical research was done by Professor Murley and me and our team also at the Children's Hospital. So that's a problem. I have no pictures in. I don't know. Gabriel or Professor Hawk, do you see do you see the pictures? I don't see the pictures. We see the slides with the written text on it, but yeah. we at the moment don't see pictures. I'm sorry. Yeah. Maybe Gabriel can give you a hand how you get uh, how you can share your. I think. Do you see the picture on your presentation? No, I don't see the pictures on my presentation. So it's mean that they not did you. Can you maybe stop the screen sharing and share it again with the yes, PowerPoint? You must share it. Bildschirm teilen. Yes. Share your screen. So I try it again. Ah. There's still no pictures in. I don't know why. No, there's no picture in. Do you have picture in your presentation? Yes. No, 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 no. So that's on you on your PowerPoint. There's no picture. That's why. Yes. Wait a moment. I try to to open a other. Uh, I have it on you my. See your bicycle. Yes, excellent bicycle. Very fast. Dr. Arjun, to take some question with Dr. Middelkorb between yeah. this time that we fixed that. Yeah, we will take the chance. Uh, well, there was a question to Esther Middelkorb. Uh, somebody is asking, one of the slides you mentioned growth factors. Could you share your experience in the field of growth factors, Dr. Middelkorb, please? Uh, yes, that was sort of a hype. Uh, probably in the 1990s um, already. Um, and actually we did quite a lot of work on that in, in relation to diabetic uh, wound healing at the time. Actually, the, uh, from my knowledge, the only growth factor that was ever uh, demonstrated to be clinically effective in promoting wound healing was um, PDGF, so platelet-derived growth factor for diabetic wounds. And in all the other cases, uh, the evidence is rather marginal. And that probably makes sense because at the time we had the idea that if you would add growth factors at a higher concentration, uh, that you would be able to influence the, the wound healing cascade. But actually the wound healing process is much more complex than that. And um, uh, what we found out in the meantime is that if you add one growth factor, uh, then you will the only thing you will do is to promote the um, the turnover of that growth factor, for example, by proteolytic enzymes, uh, and it will be reduced again. So the addition of one single growth factor in root healing to, to either initiate healing or to uh, to speed up healing has never worked. Yeah, it's a cascade. It's a complex yes. mechanism. It's a whole thing. Well, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Eduardo Rolim Tajera. And he asks us, are you familiar with autogenous tissue engineered Jace Crafts, JTEC Japan? What's, what's your impression regarding this, its clinical results? Um, I, I know the name. I have not seen uh, clinical results specifically from this uh, product. Um, we have considered uh, using that or investigating that further only a few years ago. Uh, what I believe is that they still use the 3T3 mouse fibroblast as a growth uh, substrate for the keratinocytes. 
and uh, there the regulatory issues um, uh, take over and actually the the, the ones that uh, uh, the, the full skin constructs that have reached the clinic right now uh, all use uh, serum free non uh, animal uh, derived components and and that is why we think that this particular product in Europe um, would have difficulties in being um, uh, allowed on the market. So, uh, regardless of That's it, should probably work. <laughs> yeah. uh, it also has some drawbacks in regulatory issues. Yeah, thank you. Sina Günther is asking, what methods do you use to cover the wounds in the time between biopsy harvesting? and skin substitute transplantation, a very important yes, question. That's, that's a very important question and a difficult problem to tackle. Um, in the case that I showed you, we have used Integra to bridge that time. Although at the time of transplantation of the Denovo skin, we had to remove the Integra, both the, the silicone layer and the dermal layer because uh, of an infection problem. So in that case, the Integra served a purpose uh, in that it um, bridged the time between biopsy and uh, transplantation, but we could not use it as a dermal template. Now, what another system you could use is um, uh, cadaver skin. We use in the Netherlands glycerolized cadaver skin from the your tissue bank. Uh, so that can also be used as a temporary solution. Which is very still very good. Beverwijk skin is one. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, there's Misha Tiali. Tiali, you know. Which type of mesenchymal stem cells have you tried? As there is evidence that uh, types of stem cells behave differently, is a good question. Well, I think this field is very new and promising, but uh, maybe you have some experience with it. We have we have only cellular experience in the lab, not with animals yet. We have tried to look into how mesenchymal stem cells, adipose-derived stem cells, would uh, influence the growth of keratinocytes. And strangely, other than we thought, that we are doing research on this right now, it does not always stimulate. We, we were a little frustrated for this. Yeah. The, 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 the thought would be you, you put them in and, and everything goes well. But it, yes, it's, yeah, it's, that's... maybe it's now our experiment, but it doesn't work for us right now with AESC. No, no, we have similar experience. We also used adipose-derived adipose mesenchymal stem cells um, with similar experience. So they were, in our hands, very pro-contractile and uh, too active to actually uh, have a, a dampening effect on scar tissue formation. So they were rather pro-fibrotic. Um, we also investigated uh, fetal cells, so uh, fetal dermal tissue, you could say. Uh, and also those, that was in an animal system, we, and we compared autologous versus uh, allogeneic versus fetal um, uh, mesenchymal stem cells. And actually also those um, were behaved not better than autologous dermal fibroblasts. And this is actually known for quite some time already that a superficial dermal fibroblast even behaves differently in a cell culture system than um, uh, the deeper layers of the dermal fibroblast that are already more similar to um, subcutaneous fibroblasts, which are also pro-fibrotic. Yeah, yes. I agree that we have, uh, years ago, we have uh, in interested, we were interested in seeing a uh, pectoral fibroblast from the fascia versus uh, subcutaneous in capsular contracture model. And it's also a difference in, in where you harvested them from. It's a different kind. Maybe you have time before Dr. Schiesel goes on to, to ask the last question of Roman Krishenko. What could you say about other properties of the novel skin? Oh, well, probably we should listen to Professor Schiesel first. Yes, <laughs> you, I think so too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Are you ready? Just yes, I, I'm oh, think ready. Yeah, and, and oh, this is this, this pictures, this figures. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Here and please, polychoy every inconvenience I have caused. But I reload uh, the presentation and now it works. So what we are talking about is basically this. We have a 94 square centimeters, 7 to 7 bioengineered 
skin sub substitutes in a in a matrix of a collagen hydrogen uh, hydrogel matrix with fibroblasts and keratinocytes. So the basic basic research we start now 20 years ago started with a rat model in which we take a biopsy from 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 a human being separate it to fibroblasts and the keratinocytes bring it to a matrix and put it on the, the, the immune incompetent rat for professor reichmann and his team it was very very important over a long long period to find the idle matrix in the beginning it was too fluffy then it was too to, to dense and from 2009 un until 2014 it becomes better and better and more improved and the reason for this was that they start to do a plastic compression of the combination of the collagen hydrogel uh, combination by this compression device which allowed us to define the pore size of this of this matrix that's uh, a typical course of uh, of, uh, of uh, in our red model which we have done more than 100 times that one week after transplant uh, after implantation in a kind of metal ring on a bag of a e immune incompetent rat and that's a course over the next three weeks which always ended up in the last 70, 80 uh, animals in this kind of outcome. And before we go to, or before we transfer the product to the bedside, we had to do the preclinical studies with the pigs. It was not easy because we, the clinicians, have to handle the pigs and the people from the lab or colleagues from the lab have to handle the cells of the pig, which is very, very different to the human being. And you can see the transplant or the construct is much more dense from uh, pig cells comparable to the human cells. So uh, I will show you later the difference much more, will be much more obvious. And for this, we create an animal on monitor a model with a kind of Tupperware on the back of the pig, which we, we we create a full sickness defect, put in our our silicone device, put in the de novo skin patch seven to seven, a silver dressing on it, and close the Tupperware. And that's how it looks like after three weeks when we take out the whole area and when we do the, the punch biopsy in order to do histological investigation and it looks like 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 a skin so uh, we did the phase one study first in human and the endpoint or for safety uh, with uh, money or funded by the european union and we published is in pub in, in plastic and reconstructive surgery in 2019 in the meantime, and it, and it was a very, very important moment for us that we became a, a project of Wies Zurich. Wies Zurich is a, is, a is a project in cooperation from the University of Zurich with the ETH of Zurich uh, in order to bring products from the bench to the bedside to the market. And for this reason, Kutis was founded in 2017 and as a startup of the university and the product is now called de novo skin and we are we are now in the 2b uh, study on the lead of the children's hospital in several european burn centers and the most important partner at the moment for us is the team of uh, Easter middle Corp in uh, in amsterdam you can see a patient out of the out of the phase one. You see the defect and the standard of uh, care method with a one to one point five meshed autolog skin graft. You can see how stable, how robust the product is. You can cut it, you can stable it, you can touch on it, and you will not destroy the superficial layer of keratinocytes. That's how it looks like, or we used to see it directly after the transplantation. I will show you later on uh, uh, the appearance in, in, in larger scales of, of, of coverage. And it was at day nine. 
And that's the course of the next few months, 90 days later. And you can see how pliable and especially how it looks like more comparable to the normal skin as to the already healed in 1 to 1.5 meshed skin in this patient. It needs more than 16 years from the beginning until the first transplantation in phase one, we became older, but at the end we were successful. And that was a publication. Now, I will come back to, to, uh, to, to the clinical application. And we did the first case of a large scale de novo skin, cirrhotic skin use in, I think it was, yes, it was uh, November, 2018. And it was for me a kind of Hammersmith moment. Uh, Nai Moiman, the chief of the burn center or the head of the burn center in Birmingham and I, together with Fabian Hartmann from Kutis, were sitting in front of this door. The reason for this was we were invited to, 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 to discuss with the ethical committee of the National Health Service in England to uh, include Birmingham in as, as, a, as a study site into the study of de novo skin. And it was unbelievable because we have to wait three hours until they let us in. And during these three hours, the uh, Nai Moyman received a phone call from his unit. They had admitted a four years old boy with 95% TBS, a deep, deep TBSA burns. And in front of this store, we decided we want to do the first use, large scale use of de novo skin. And on behalf of this, uh, of this uh, meeting with the ethical committee, we will ask them that they will allow us to do it immediately after we went back to our, to our centers. And we were successful, they allowed us. And we started the joint venture between the Zurich team and uh, the Birmingham team. And that's how it looks like when you are in the happy situation that you are very, very successful. And in one way, we were very successful at this moment. We were very happy about this. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this boy died after three months after we have been completely, after the team of Birmingham, with the support of us, have completely covered the boy. He died due to the third or fourth hit of a sepsis in a multi-organ failure. That was very, very hard for us to accept. But I will show you the pictures of this patient, which was the first time also we give the stuff out of the hospital over a very, very uh, wide distance. You can see on the left side the container in which we transport or the transfer the, uh, the product. And you must, you must keep in mind that one of these devices is only for Two, for, two, for two sheets of de novo skin. It's a very, very sophisticated and well-established uh, uh, transport system, which needs a lot of, uh, a lot of for and many years to establish it and to do it along the lines of legal uh, demandings. In the middle, you see Nai Moyman working together with his team and on the right side, the flosses with uh, now empty and uh, the skin is on the patient. How it looks, the skin or de novo skin, the Zurich skin on the patient, that's directly after the, after the transplantation. And for me, it was very, very exciting to see how my friend Nai Moyman react on this kind of skin substitute. He was really amazed because he say, it's far away from, from CAs, and from all the stuff I have used in the past, it, it is like a full sickness skin graft. You can handle it. it. It's robust like a full sickness skin graft. And you can touch on it. You can stable it. You can, you can cut it. So that's the course. That's typically the appearance one week after the, after the transplantation. And I've never seen that you can... You, you have a recapitalization when you press this kind of, uh, of, early, of early outcome of de novo skin or Zurich skin. 
and it's 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 like a split thickness or a full thickness skin graft, and that's one of the last pictures we take from the boy. Uh, as I told you, it was very very hard to at the end after three months and a lot of lot lot of struggle to save his life to be not not successful. But in January 2020, we we admitted to our own hospital a patient, 14-year-old patient with 95% TBS A again after a severe flame injury. And it was a door-to-door -door situation. It was only a few kilometers from our hospital. Uh, and he was admitted to, to the hospital, to the burn unit, one hour after, after the injury. And uh, that was basically the situation in, in the view of, 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 of the size of the burns, 95%, really deep flame burn. And we only had 600 square centimeters of donor area, 150 square centimeter on each foot, back of the foot, and 300 on his scalp. You can see how it looks like when you are burned, deep burned, 95%. And that's the donor areas. So the scalp, 300 square centimeters, and both feet. And we were able to harvest, and it's, I think that's very, very, very important. We were able to harvest two hours after the injury, a skin biopsy of about 20 square centimeters. We divided it in two parts. We sent 10 square centimeters to our national laboratory in Lausanne, which is used to provide us with CEAs, keratinocyte sheets, and after uh, in, a, in a time frame of two weeks, and after five weeks, it was a combination of, of co-cultures. Co-cultures mean uh, uh, a thin layer of of, of fibroblast in combination with keratinocytes. And the rest, 10 square centimeters, we send it to Kutis or to the V-Sender, where the production uh, lab is, to produce de novo skin or Zurich skin for this patient. And the strategy was to cover it in the first steps as our standard strategy with allografts, then to go stepwise to, uh, to change the allograft against dermal substitutes. And at this moment, it was, a it was the first month which in which was uh, Novosorb, BTM, polyurethane, uh, dermal template was available in Switzerland. Uh, we decided to use in this case the new dermal template we are used to use Integra, but from our colleagues in Australia, we know that especially in the view of uh, infection, the no, the Novoski, um, uh, Novosaur BTM she, seem to be much more resistant against bacterial infection as we used to see it in Integra. And at this moment, we decided to go for, for BTM. So later on strategy consists of split thickness skin graft. Of course, we used sheet graft for the face and for the hands. And we were very limited by the donor sites, as you see. And we did, uh, or we used me craft, for example, for the back. And the rest we have to cover with autologous skin substitutes from one side, from, from Lausanne, from our standard uh, lab, and from our research lab in Zurich. So that's, uh, that's picture show you uh, the areas and the different areas and what we put on in order to cover it to cover him completely. And I want to talk mainly about the area here and the anterior trunk in which we mainly use the, the Zurich skin. In combination or after application of, of, of allografts and in, in combination with BDM, with Novosorb, with uh, polyurethane uh, uh, dermal template. That was a typical, or that's a typical situation before we start to cover it with our with our uh, with our skin substitutes, and in this at this moment when 
when we no, don't know if it really feasible the combination of de novo skin with BTM. We go for the first delivery uh, on an already used uh, method because the Birmingham child was covered with, with allocrafts until we put on the de novo skin. And you can see here again, it's, it's very robust. You can take it with, with, with two forceps, you can place it, you can move it, you can cut it, you can stable it. And we used to have this combination with the silver dressing. It do, uh, we, without do any harm to the keratinocytes. And uh, we let it on one week. So that's a typical period, appearance after one week. What I have never seen in using keratinocytes or co-cultures, fibroblasts together with keratinocytes, is that you have this kind of hyperkeratosis. <laughs> after one week of uh, after application of the novo skin. So you have an unbelievable, uh, uh, robust, uh, superficial layer of keratinocytes. All of you, you have when you ha ever have used uh, keratinocyte sheets or co-cultures, you know that after seven to eight days, you have a very, very, very fragile uh, surface and never ever you can touch it or you can uh, without do any harm to, to the already covered area. That's how it looks like over the next few weeks. It's typical that you have a kind of delayed uh, grow in healing of the de novo skin. You see in this area, de novo skin after, after three weeks or two weeks and three weeks. And you see here the co-culture still covered with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a cotton gauze. But you will see in the further course how the difference is between the conventional skin substitutes consisting of only of fibroblasts and keratinocytes or only keratinocytes comparable to the more complex construct of de novo skin or Zurich skin consisting of this matrix with the autologous fibroblasts and keratinocytes in. Is that how it looks like six weeks later when you have a closed surface and that's how it looks three months later. And it's it, it started to become obvious that the areas in which we had applied the de novo skin, you have a much more ply pliable and much more uh, improved texture comparable to the area in which we used the keratinocytes or the cool cultures only. Is that how it looks like now, I think, three months after after the transplantation. And you can see here the areas with the novo skin also in here, also a little bit out of his trousers here. And that's a, a result four months after the application. And you can see you have a, a, a shrinkage, a much more, more shrinkage in the area which we covered with, uh, with uh, CEAs in combination with fibroblasts. And uh, you see the, the blue framed areas with, uh, covered with the novo skin, Zurich skin. So to summarize, like only a few other research group around the world, uh, Esther mentioned, mentioned one of our dinosaurs in this field of Stephen Boyce. We achieve our goal to bring a complex epidermal dermal autologous skin substitute from the bench to the bedside. We are now, we now testing de novo skin in a phase two study all over Europe. In one of our last patients with 95 TBAs, TBSA we used in our skin, among other autologous skin substitutes successfully. And after follow-up of several months, the skin seemed to be to have an excellent long-term outcome. And we, we, we should keep in mind when we having more comprehensive pro production facilities than we have at the moment at the current situation under study conditions. 
the Novo skin for the Novo skin and also the Zurich skin, it should be possible to have an expansion rate of about one to 500, which means that we can produce 5,000 square centimeters out of the biopsy of 10 square centimeters. And, and the patient you already saw in my presentation, we had an expansion rate one to 130. The problems we have solved in the future, and uh, I think it, you talked already about this, is on one side the production time and on one side the bridging strategy on the patient after early excision of the burn until the de novo skin and the Zurich skin is a viable. So thank you very much for your attention and again Please apologize, inconvenience in, st at, in the start of my presentation by missing the pictures. Congratulations. This was fascinating and um, beautiful talk. Everybody who has ever done this sort of surgery knows what it means, what you achieved at last, uh, similar to Esther Middlecop. Uh, of course, it gives a lot of questions uh, that have needs to be need to be solved. And uh, maybe one short remark. I remember the great Andrew Munster. He did once a research, uh, maybe 20 years ago, where he showed that those people, uh, burn people who were treated with skin substitutes, that at the time it was epidermal sh uh, sheet grafts, um, did survive, but they cost more than a million dollars, while the other persons um, who were in the other arm of the study died. And there's a problem that, of course, we can see it must be very costly what you do and it's not possible for you to do this for free so i can understand that you need to somehow merchandise the thing and get uh, like a outsourced uh, facility that you obviously made up and congratulations for doing so it was so speckle it was so fantastic to see what what these things these crafts did compared to the other areas and uh, obviously maybe you can explain a little bit more to the audience the complex concept that you do because you don't have enough from this material. So you, you mix something and maybe you can give one or two sentences shortly to say how you deal the large area burns where you do not have enough of the skin. You, you put different various method, methods. So you, how, how, where do you put it and at what areas do, need, do you think are the most important to cover? Yes. So for example, the back, the back the back which is the most difficult one for to use any kind of autologous skin substitute because you have the patient lying on the back is covered with novo uh, novo soap with btm in combination with meek meek is a very very effective uh, method but anyway the expansion rate of meek is uh, in the maximum one to nine and one to nine using one to nine means that you will have you end up in a very, very, very poor quality of skin. Um, we, the strategy was to, to do the back, to do the face and the hands uh, with, uh, with, with the autolog skin graft while we try to cover the rest with the conventional, conventional uh, skin from the lab from Lausanne which are CEAs in the beginning, only CEAs, which we are used to use for many, many years. They are very, very fragile. They have the disadvantage, uh, Esther already showed to us, the skin is very instable for, for a long period. And we use uh, the co-cultures, which are a simple construct of few layers of, of fibroblasts uh, and on top, a uh, few layers of keratinocytes uh, a, a kind of improved CEA version. Uh, this you have to, you, when you put on, we are, we don't expect that we have a graft take of 100% in the first, in the first application. We often have to, to redo it or to, to, to cover some areas we lost during the next few weeks. In this patient, to be honest, we were very, very successful with all, with all kind of stuff we received from the lab, as well as the CEAs, as well as the co-cultures, as well as the novo skin. What we see in the long run that we have and what we basically expected 
a better outcome in in the view or in the view of pliability of the skin of the texture of the skin that's that's at the moment for me is the most important uh, advantage beneath that it's much more easier to handle the novo skin as a fragile stuff of CEA, for example Thank you so much. We have some questions. We go right shortly. We go into the questions since the time is running. There, uh, greetings, by the way, to Yekaterinburg, to other places in the world. Uh, we have so many people now joining us, meanwhile. So thank you for, for sharing this uh, webinar. Uh, Mariel, Mariel G is asking, could you comment on the donor cell isolation and expansion? Uh, is there a risk? if the donor cells are not expanding fast enough to make operating with the novel feasible at all. Yeah. So I will do only a short introduction and give over to Daniela Marino. I think from the clinical point of view, it's very important to have a biopsy as early as you can to, to harvest it when the patient came in. And the next is you must be able to harvest a non-contaminated biopsy. Otherwise, you will run in a lot of problems during uh, the process in the lab. But the rest have to be answered by Danielo Marino. Thank you, okay. Clemens. Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, we are on the manufacturing side. I mean, we are, I'm the CEO of the, of the company, of the Kutis. And I can tell you that uh, clearly there will always be a variation between patients. So some patient cells may be faster than other patient cells. And this is like a human factor we cannot control. Uh, Clement is correct. Definitely the clinicians have a big role when isolating the biopsy to do it as clean and sterile, I mean, in brackets, as possible. Um, and also the thickness matters a lot because as Clemens very, very extensively showed, we have a, a, a fibroblast uh, component in the, in the construct. So if the split thickness skin we receive is too thin and we only have few fibroblasts, the culture will be slower because we need to grow them uh, longer. Uh, and if, the, if the, the biopsy is too thick, then we have also a problem because we have to uh, adapt the protocol for something which may be double the thickness of what the protocol allows us to isolate from. So it's very important that the surgeon takes a st a strong consideration on, on how to isolate the biopsy. And we on our side are working on incredible improvements to make sure that we can routinely isolate always the same amount of cells and always be able to deliver the product within three to four weeks at the moment. Commercially speaking, for the next two years, we're targeting a, a, a production process of 22 days. So that's the fastest we can get so far. Maria, uh, thank but you. The, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, one more question. Uh, of course, people are asking if it's possible, if you could name an amount, a price. A how price. Would, <laughs> how, how could yes, the price is... Yes, yes I mean, the price the is, of course... Should, yeah, I mean, the price is, of course, a sensitive topic, especially because we have not yet scaled up the production. So we are still producing small batches for a small number of patients. What I can tell you is that there is a, the only reference in the, in the uh, Western world. You mentioned JTEC before, but Epicell in, in the US, it is a product which is sold and, uh, and reimbursed and it has a price. It's about $200,000 to cover 20% of TBSA. And we will definitely try to stay equal or below that number. Uh, we are not going to try to enter the market with a product which is double the price because it would be not accepted. So okay, we will try our best. How long does it take until you have a cultured uh, de novo skin substance? Yes, right now it's three to four weeks, but we target 22 days in the next two years. And maybe Dr. Schissel can answer the question, did the patient from Irina Sala, did the patient regain partial peripheral sensitivity after the transplant or not? Yes. It's, Yes, yes, it's comparable to uh, to to grafted area with 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 outer locus skin grafts, and it seemed be it seemed to be no problem. We haven't seen in the past any kind of problems, also by using CEA, CDAs, or de novo skin. Uh, so sen sensibility will, will come back after after two to three weeks, as we used to see it in split sickness skin grafts. Yes. Thank you for answering this. Uh, well, thank you both speakers for doing such a beautiful job and fantastic research. And we can see that uh, there's a lot of efforts in it and that you love what you are doing, taking care of these birth patients. I want to hand over to Professor Middlecope because we have to go on in the program and she will probably introduce the next speaker.
Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we will uh, definitely move on. And it's my pleasure and my honor to introduce the president of the uh, G-SCAR Society, the Global SCAR Society, who has also chaired and organized for us many uh, inspiring meetings in Montpellier. And of course, I'm talking about uh, Professor Luc Théo. Um, and this afternoon, he will speak to us about uh, collagen skin substitutes. Luc, I gladly hand over the floor to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Esther. Thank you for the quality of all the speakers who uh, accepted uh, to share this very uh, exciting uh, uh, afternoon. Do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, so I'm sorry, I will start by the end, but this is just to show you. So I will uh, come back on, uh, I would say, uh, more trivial uh, topics um, like chronic wounds and other indications of the dermal substitutes. And I'm opening a session, a part of the session, which is uh, concerning the non-cellularized dermal substitutes, which have to be uh, revascularized and repopularized by uh, by cells. Uh, in fact, uh, since, uh, well, more than 20 years, we could see a myriad of uh, wound matrices which are commercially available. Uh, the mechanism of action remain uh, poorly understand. Uh, some, some, some details um, uh, remain poorly understood. Uh, we have commercially uh, available wound matrices, but they are multiple. And uh, we spoke about some of them which are temporarily helping to reconstruct dermal matrix. We'll come back on that. Others are slowly remodeled, allowing them to be skin grafted. We've seen that. Uh, we spoke about the hyaluronic acid, and we will see some cases uh, where the hyaluronic acid was, uh, was used, included in the, uh, the may help matrix reconstruction, maybe some inflammatory process, uh, not completely understood. And others like uh, act like uh, matrix reconstruction booster dressings and more than, uh, uh, than really uh, dermal substitutes. The topic, as it was said, uh, is very exciting and a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, teams uh, around the world working on these uh, collagen fibers, whatever be the origin, uh, mixing with uh, glycosaminoglycans and other uh, compounds in order to uh, to uh, to have it, it uh, more elastic, uh, uh, more uh, tensile, uh, uh, the tensile strengths and uh, uh, well and and all the, the features of uh, of uh, comparing uh, comparing or comparable to a dam, a real dam. The goals are uh, uh, skin elasticity, tear resistance, and low adherence uh, to. Uh, uh, to the underlying tissues, uh, it can, uh, and this is funny because it, it can stick to the bone, but not to the tendon. And uh, we see uh, when using them in a clinical practice that there are differences and uh, some, uh, well, uh, some, uh, well, tricks are are, uh, are present, and you need to familiarize with them if you want to be successful. It's a it's a unique option to cover an exposed bone. This is new. This was uh, completely new for us. Because you can see that it's this collagen, which is supposed to be infected in the next minutes, in fact, is uh, uh, sticking to the bone. And even on a, on a non-periosted uh, uh, bone, you can have some uh, uh, coverage, which makes it uh, uh, in, in some way comparable to flaps. And this is uh, maybe an alternative to flaps in the reconstructive surg surgery ladders. And uh, uh, a comparison were already made uh, between flaps and dermal substitutes. If we go to try classification of dermal substitutes, we can divide them into collagen-based, like Integra, Nevelia, with the reinforced silicon-based uh, uh, collagen. Uh, we'll see that later. Uh, Pelnac, uh, Matridem, uh, some others were already well presented or discussed, uh, like uh, cadaver-based, like Allodem or Stratis. Uh, Yaluronic acid is, was, well, 20 years ago, uh, uh, presented as, as something very interesting. It's still, or maybe in some cases, and others like uh, temporary matrices are coming from a big submucosa, like the product which is called Oasis. The composition, uh, uh, we have uh, 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 pure bovine 
cross-linked collagen for Integra, which was the first on the market, uh, linked to glycose amino glycans, uh, like uh, chondroitin-6 uh, sulfate coming from shark cartilage. Uh, Matridum was uh, uh, presented already as pure bovine collagen, no cross-linking, elastin from bovine nuchal uh, ligament by hydrolysis. Uh, Matridum is more elastic than uh, Integra, and it's uh, one, one, uh, one, one step, I would say, a surgical procedure. Nevelia uh, with the uh, originality of having a reinforced silicone to increase uh, uh, the, the and, and, and some experimented uh, uh, some experimentations went to uh, uh, reinforce this uh, uh, this well uh, more strengths in terms of and the consequences will be presented later by Professor Uchon. Uh, well, the indications are more or less in a combination with uh, autologous uh, split skin graft. You can do it immediately, like matriderm. So you, you put your matriderm and then uh, immediately an autologous uh, split uh, skin graft. Or uh, in a secondary time, when, the, when you, you use a, a, a double layer, what is called a double layer uh, a collagen uh, skin substitute, and uh, we wait, you wait for three weeks before removing the silicone film and you apply then your autologous uh, split skin graft. Um, you, the, the aim is, is to reconstruct the dermis in deep dermal defect, uh, in full sickness skins, in burns, but also traumas, in plastic reconstructive surgery for uh, uh, resurfacing hypertrophic scars or uh, keloids, uh, in chronic wounds and after tumor resection, uh, these are uh, different indications into which these dermal substitutes will be used. Uh, how to use it is quite uh, acquired now by most of the uh, surgeons. Uh, after a surgical debridement and a careful hemostasis, I insist on the hemostasis because this is very sensitive, uh, you will apply the dermal substitute with a single layer immediately covered by skin graft and a double layer, the silicone layer, is removed after three weeks, then covered by a skin graft. Uh, you can cut sheets to avoid gaps and overlaps. Uh, all what is uh, uh, um, limits is very sensitive also, and you can fix them with staples or uh, sutures. And uh, well, dressings used to cover the, the dermal substitute, if you apply uh, staples, there is a risk of local infection, so you will use, uh, cover them with antibacterial uh, substances like betadine, uh, gauze, and uh, all, uh, all the companies have their own uh, process in order to a uh, cooking process, I would say, in order to prevent infection to come back. Uh, popularized uh, 10, 10, 15 years ago, negative pressure wound therapy, which was uh, uh, covering dermal substitutes in order to increase the speed of revascularization at a, a, a level uh, uh, in terms of negative pressure, which was minus 50 or minus 75, some of them using minus to 125, still under discussion. But the, 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 the idea is to reduce the pressure in order to reduce uh, the crashing uh, uh, possibility for negative pressure. The dressing change is done uh, every two or three days, and you minimize. You have to minimize the shear forces and, and the weight on 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 the covered wound. Complication, of course, always. Uh, you can uh, uh, have hematomas if your uh, if your hemostasis is not completely uh, done, uh, or fluid accumulation if you don't press a little bit over the dermal substitutes because it doesn't stick immediately. Uh, you can have also areas of incomplete take or a purulence of in, or infection, it's collagen, and you know that uh, uh, this is a risk. This progressive revascularization concerning the double layer uh, is uh, uh, in three weeks or more uh, issuing to a functional dermis, and after removal, you have a thin skin graft which is applied, and you see here uh, the process which is on, on the drawings showing how it, it, it comes to uh, something which is revascularized. Uh, the first time you apply your skin skin graft you know, uh, over the over the the product, uh, uh, you you need courage, I would say, because it's yellow. It doesn't look like anything you know, and uh, so you you at the beginning it's a little bit uh, frightening, uh, but then uh, you make your own experience and you get better. This is what we did uh, here, uh, necrotizing facetis, a uh, very huge one coming in a septicemic uh, uh, status. With all, you see on the, on the, on the left uh, the extent of, of this uh, necrotizing facetis. Uh, when we open, we find a, a, a severe uh, infection on the, on the, grill, on the 
uh, thorax grill. Uh, we had to come back uh, uh, many times. Negative pressure wound therapy plus installation, uh, and then the, uh, dermal substitutes, and then it, it looks a little bit like uh, a burns uh, after a while, uh, but it's easy in order, and you couldn't cover that with any other technique. Uh, so you need to have that uh, ready to, to be used in the fridge, uh, and um, it, it helps you a lot for the large, very large, like burns uh, areas. Others um, uh, um, which are more sensible to uh, elasticity, I would say, you excise at the fascia uh, malignant tumor like uh, fibrosarcoma here, uh, respecting uh, uh, extended uh, tendons and evolution after one month. You see it, uh, it's, it's coming from animals, so it's still red, a little bit inflammatory, but it, it will go out uh, with, uh, with time and you get a, a beautiful uh, scar with uh, no uh, uh, problems in terms of function and you didn't lose a lot uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of capacities of the hand to, uh, to be moved. Matriderm, uh, uh, I just present one case because you already had the, the chief of the chief's uh, presentation concerning Matriderm. Uh, this is, well, it looks, uh, well, uh, banal, I would say, but it's very uh, uh, effective. Uh, the, the case we, we started with some years ago was a deep second degree on the skull and third degree excision between uh, day five and day 15 because the resuscitation could do, could not allow us to do it better uh, earlier. It was a single stage procedure and the, the surface was very large. We covered the uh, with a partial skin graft. Uh, all the skull was uh, exposed uh, uh, and uh, we had uh, this matriderm coming on the skull and covered and uh, some days after you see that uh, the, the 30 on 30 centimeters was covered using a, well, quite easy to do uh, procedure. Uh, we were surprised also by the quality of uh, uh, the matriderm when uh, covering faces, burn faces. We get really, really good results uh, with, uh, uh, with my team uh, concerning this, uh, 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 this pro procedure. Uh, and even if it looks, uh, well, not fantastic in the middle, at the end, uh, uh, it's a, a real progress concerning uh, just a simple non-use uh, of the dermal safety, it is sim simple skin grafting. And I think it will be uh, a challenge for uh, the novo skin to, to, to compare that with, uh, with a spontaneous repopulation of, this, uh, of these dermal substitutes. Nevelia, we're uh, going to uh, diabetic foot ulcer because this is also a potential indication with a female which is uh, 60 years old, a neuropathic DFU, fully compliant. And we, it, we come, uh, she's coming with a purulent chronic wound on the right diabetic foot ulcer and the second metatarsophalangeal joint presented an osteoarthritis. So this is uh, preoperative in the OR. This is what we did, uh, uh, amputation uh, of the uh, second two with a big hole, and we filled all this uh, uh, spaced, space with uh, negative pressure wound therapy installation for 14 days, then Nevelia, and the preparation to skin grafting uh, at the 21, and we did this uh, split epidermal dermal graft, and this is a result at three months, at six months, at 12 months, you see, uh, uh, she's not, uh, I, as I said, very compliant, so some recurrence will occur, but not on the grafted area. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, something to be, uh, uh, you can use them even in, on, in a weight-bearing area. Yellow matrix acid, this is a case which was coming from a friend from uh, uh, Argentina who used it, and you see that on exposed uh, burn uh, hand, that uh, it, it will create a, a, a beautiful uh, granulation tissue uh, very quickly. So maybe we can um, classify the yellow matrix and uh, yellow uronic acid as a, a pro-granulation uh, uh, tool. Pelnac, for our colleagues uh, who uh, uh, listen for us uh, from Japan, uh, this case was uh, given by, by Sadanari Akita from uh, Fukuoka, and uh, it's um, a temporary skin substitute that you can use uh, uh, just to prepare the, a little bit like yellow matrix, to prepare the, the, the wound before skin grafting, and it's uh, give you a, a beautiful uh, uh, granulation tissue. So in conclusion, I would say, are dermal substitutes a credible alternative to flaps? 
Uh, yes, when flap is technically difficult uh, because uh, wound closure is difficult or uh, uh, we have a non-adhesive plan uh, or because uh, flap is not the best, the best choice because of localization and mainly on, on thickness. And the question is on, on feet, on foot, on a, 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 where the, the, the dermal substitute may have some future uh, compared to uh, non re uh, uh, flaps coming from the legs. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Luc. There are some questions in the audience I see already. Um, quest uh, I, I would like to welcome Cyprus. I would like to welcome Russia. Uh, I saw the statistics. More than 30 nations, more than 150 people uh, have been attending this, uh, this webinar so far. Uh, one of the questions from Russia, is uh, is it present, I think it was uh, related to Nevelia, is it present on the Russian market? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, my colleague from Rome will uh, speak about that uh, easier than me, but I, 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 I know that it's on the Russian market now, it's coming on the Russian market. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will postpone the next uh, round of questions until after the presentation of uh, Professor Luigi Uccioli. I should try to pronounce this correctly. Um, thank you very much, Luke, and welcome, Professor Uccioli. Uh, professor Uccioli is Professor in Endocrinology and Diapetology in uh, the University of Rome. Welcome you to you very much this afternoon on the Cheese Cars webinar. And uh, we're very much looking forward to hear your talk on uh, the role of macrophages in uh, macrophage modulation with nephilia. I'm looking forward to that. The floor is yours. Do we have sound for Professor Uccioli? Professor Uccioli, you need to open your microphone. And you can share your screen also with your presentation. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, now we hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, at least this afternoon for me. And uh, <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Uh, thank you, Luke, for the invitation. I will share um, my recent research on the, the role of um, uh, derma substitutes and uh, in managing the uh, cells in the, in the wounds. And I will show you immediately. Okay. This is the... Okay, I have to... It's okay. Can you see? Um, not yet. So we're not seeing not your yet. presentation. You need to um, go on, yeah, share the screen with you. Yeah. Um, okay, this is my presentation. So to pre-open your presentation and you come back on our platform. Open. This is my. It's okay. Are you see? Yeah. Okay. And, and you can put into the full screen and we. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, mm, full thickness skin defects are a reconstructive challenge. And you know that there are several modalities. We have already heard about epidermal substitutes, dermal regenerative templates. And the bilayer matrix uh, uh, is a sterile medical device consisting of collagen porous layer to promote and guide regeneration and reinforce the silicon layer acting as a pseudo epidermis. The collagen serves as a support for cell infiltration, thus contributes to the natural tissue regeneration process. And the silicon layer is removed after dermal regeneration at the time of the thin strips thickness skin graft. 
This is a, a cartoon in which you can uh, can see from the top the uh, uh, um, uh, healing processes uh, as a second intention. This is the uh, aspect of uh, a dermal uh, with the silicon sheet above, and you can see that the the, the dermal template may uh, uh, host cells from the uh, from the wound as well as growth factors and it can uh, represent the the uh, scale and the, uh, the the template in, on which the the, the cells uh, can duplicate this is the the, uh, the um, uh, way in which we have uh, uh, considered the uh, uh, derma substitute until now, and several uh, papers have been published to uh, show the, the effect uh, as uh, the, the role as bio scaffolds on the uh, on the um, wound healing. Uh, but uh, there is a, a different way uh, to. Uh, consider the biomaterial that we use to uh, treat our wounds. And we can imagine that this biomaterial bio uh, may influence uh, the, uh, the, the uh, tissue repair processes uh, in sense that they can uh, stimulate, a, a, in some cases, a pro-inflammatory activity, in other cases, anti-inflammatory activity. So using the, this, those biomaterials, we can really uh, change the, 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 the way in which the cells of the wound uh, may respond uh, to the healing processes. One of the areas in which um, this aspect has been uh, studied more is the, the effect of the uh, scaffold on the uh, cells, on the um, macrophage. And uh, um, it, it, it has been observed that, that the um, uh, biomaterial can influence macrophage polarization. We know that uh, M1 um, macrophages are um, cells uh, that are more related to inflammatory processes and M2 cells uh, are uh, the same cells with the uh, different phenotype that are more related to the um, reparative processes. And we know that uh, M1 cells may transform in M2 cells, in, in, so uh, shifting the, the condition M1 and M2. And the, the, the hypothesis is that the biomaterials may really uh, modulate this kind of uh, um, uh, change. And you can see that uh, recently uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, dermal substitute Nevelia has been utilized uh, to uh, stimulate the uh, three-dimensional culture and assess the inflammatory activation modulation of monocytes and macrophages. So, uh, with this background, uh, the aim of our study was uh, to evaluate whether uh, the um, Nevelia, uh, composed by uh, collagen, uh, was able to activate the plasticity of wound macrophages by inducing their polarization from M1 inflammatory to M2 reparative. This is a, a randomized controlled study with a, a control group uh, um, and uh, a treated group, both treated by the treatment and uh, dressing and offloading. In addition, in the treated group was treated with the graft of Nevelia. The, the lesions were uh, non-ischemic, uninfected and chronic lesion with the size measured than five centimeters square, and the biopsy was taken times zero uh, uh, 30 days after. And the immunochemistry was uh, done with the, the, the monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies to stain uh, the macrophages M1 and M2. 
The measuring point to consider was uh, uh, characterization of uh, macrophage at uh, T1 after 30 days, and the, all, the only thing at the point was healing after six months of follow up. You can see uh, this is the treated group, this is the control group, no differences in the characteristic of the patients or differences in the characteristic of the, of the ulcers. And you can see that after six months of observation, six patients, 60% of the treated group completely healed, while only one patient, 20%, healed in the control group. No amputation that's recorded. This is regarding the clinical outcomes. And these are some slides of the one patient. This is another, another one. But uh, the histological picture are probably are more interesting, and uh, you can uh, see this is uh, uh, hematocylin eosin at the uh, beginning, and uh, you can see uh, the large uh, ulcerative areas uh, that are present in a uh, control group uh, at the beginning and after uh, 30 days. This is uh, uh, the, the treated group in, in which you can see here at time zero uh, the um, uh, deposit of mucopolysaccharides acids and after 30 days you can see uh, a lot uh, of uh, um, large area of uh, tissue repaired in the, uh, in the um, uh, treated group after 30 days. But it's very interesting uh, the, uh, the, the presence of M1 and you can see that while at uh, time zero, the presence of M1 inflammatory uh, macrophage is very high, is reduced significantly uh, after 30 days. You can see in this other picture. On the contrary, you can see here uh, that we have M2 uh, cells that are uh, uh, few at time zero increase significantly at, at time one after 30 days. And the, you can see here numbers and the, the, um, the, uh, while in the control group we have no differences uh, from time zero to time one uh, in uh, both M1 and M2 cells, you can see here that in the patients treated with Nevelia, we have a, a reduced, a significantly a reduced number of M1 cells, a significantly increased number of uh, M2 cells. This is a, a cartoon to show better uh, this kind of, of results. But we have also performed the confocal microscopy, and you can see uh, these are all the cells. These are all macrophages, these are the M2 macrophages. And in the confocal, the characteristic of is that we have the cells all together, and you can see here all cells in, in, in green, all macrophages, and few red spots that are M2 uh, macrophages in time zero. This is time 30, again, all cells all macrophages and again M2 macrophages. And you can see in the confocal, you can have a lot of M2 macrophages. And you can see that, that, that in number, in Nevelia group, you have an increase of 36.6% of in the presence of M2 uh, macrophages in after uh, 30 days in the group uh, treated by Nevelia. We have, uh, of course, a limitation in our study. This is a, study, is a single center study. The study group is composed of a very small number of patients, and the different comparison with other uh, substitutes. So we, so we don't know if this is an effect of all dermal substitutes or is specific of Nevelia. Even if other uh, experimental study show that some effects may, may be specific. In, in conclusion, Nevelia is able to stimulate healing in non-healing chronic wounds and is able to induce an important macrophage activation with a very strong switch toward the M2 repairing phenotype. 
Therefore, it may represent an effective therapeutic strategy to activate the tissue regeneration in pathological conditions. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Piccioli, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. It raises uh, some questions, at least in my head. What do, you, what do you think is the reason for this immunomodulation? And that actually uh, alludes to the question of Carlotta Scarpa uh, and Professor Franco Bassetto from Padua, uh, who asked that the company supporting Nefelia speaks about immunomodulation. Uh, what do you think about that and why? And my question is actually, uh, how does this work? Is it the collagen specifically? Or what, what do you think is the explanation for this effect that you have seen? But the, the idea is uh, uh, that uh, uh, every type of scaffold we use is able to modulate the cells in the, in the wounds. Uh, there are some observations on uh, uh, hyaluronic acids that uh, the mm, uh, type of hyaluronic acid with the low or high molecular weight may differently influence uh, the presence in M1 or M2. So it depends on the, mm, uh, the, the uh, tissue, uh, the, the, the derma substance that we use. So uh, the, the uh, intriguing thing is that uh, we uh, used to, to consider uh, the um, derma substitutes uh, as uh, uh, only a, a, a scaffold, as a three-dimensional scaffold. The data that are coming out um, uh, really show that uh, this is not true, and uh, we must consider also the, the fact that the, the, the uh, material that we use to manage our wounds, uh, the fact that may have on the, the cellularity and on the type of the, the cells that we have. So this is, uh, I, 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 my idea is a new, new, new topic that we have to explore. Yes, so it would be really interesting to see if other uh, compositions of dermal substitutes or other collagen materials perhaps would do uh, would have similar effect as you suggested already. Um, there's also one question from uh, Dr. Irma Oon, she's from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, what do you advise to use as a secondary dressing on top of Nevelia? So the dressing is uh, really uh, not so influenced because uh, uh, the, mm, the very interesting uh, characteristic of Nevelia is the silicon sheet that uh, is uh, very uh, is very con consistent and it allows to 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 put on fair thermally on the on the on the wound so you you can uh, just uh, uh, apply and uh, consider it uh, as a, a, an artificial skin and uh, live there for, for a long time. Then you can uh, use secondary dressing, but it's uh, just goes, nothing else. Okay. And then uh, there's one more question from Fabas Joe. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, no. is is the presence of periosteum the only factor to make nephilia work when applying on exposed bone? Uh, and do you agree that suturing would be better than stapling? But the, the, we, we used the to, to, to cover bone and we, we have got good results. And uh, we uh, sometimes, I do prefer uh, suturing sometime we we step for reason of time so uh, both the, 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 the option but uh, normally I uh, just uh, the idea it depends in which part of the foot I have to apply in order to have the, the best um, 
way to, to, to leave uh, uh, Nevelia on the wound. Thank you. And what is your experience on this topic, particularly, Professor Theo? Do you prefer uh, suturing or stapling, or does it depend on the situation? Uh, I, I would opt for uh, suturing because uh, foreign material uh, combined with uh, collagen is not only for Nevelia, it's globally for all dermal substitutes. Uh, uh, staying the, the less possible uh, material, uh, well, prone to be infected is uh, good advice, I, I would say. Good. Um, I think there are, for this for these two lectures, no more questions in the, um, in the chat, if I see correctly. So, um, in view of the time, uh, we have been running late a little bit, but that's, um, I think, uh, the way that uh, we are used to in uh, working with the G-Scars and working with the former SCAR club. We always uh, stretch the time a little bit. Um, thank you for your attention uh, at this point. And I would like to ask my co-chair to um, come up again and um, end this session with me. And if we can have the, uh, uh, the final slides as well. Uh, I would like to draw once more your attention to the textbook on scar management. This is uh, a publication from the uh, G-SCAR Society. Uh, it is open access textbook and it is uh, therefore free downloadable. You can also order a hard copy, which is really nice uh, looking, but you can uh, download all the text from the Springer website. Um, and then uh, I would like to also draw your attention to the upcoming meeting in Paris uh, from Yuma, Journée Cicatitration, uh, ETOS, um, uh, Global Scar Society, of course. We hope to be uh, present in Paris, uh, but if you cannot be present, then there will uh, definitely be a, a mixed, uh, it will be a mixed conference with virtual as well as live presentations and hopefully we will also be able to go to uh, Tokyo at the end of the year. Uh, we hope that the world is free to travel by that time again and then there will be the second world congress of the Global Scar Society hosted by Professor Ray Ogawa. And with that I give the word to my co-chair. <laughs> thank you very much, thank you, um, thank you to my co-chair also. Thank you, Luc, for organizing everything. And uh, thank you all for giving these fantastic, for me, fantastic presentations. You can see um, how, how people who are dedicated to this care of scars and everything are uh, really engaged in what they do. We have felt this through all the lectures, certainly. We have seen the questions. We have had persons from more than 30 countries in the world who joined us for this webinar. And um, also congratulations to the free download of the book, which is very, very nice book. Uh, I downloaded it already. <laughs> and um, so it's my task to, to say thank you. Thank you to all of you and thank you to the society and to announce that there's gonna be a next webinar on 23rd of April, also three o'clock PM, uh, where the topic will be laser technology for scarring process uh, and uh, biomodulation. It sounds also very interesting. The scarring process is something that needs to be addressed and lasers are commonly used. So we are looking up to see you all in this next webinar. Thank you so far. Thank you for the nice discussion, for all the questions and thank you to all the speakers. I give back probably to Luke. Maybe he will say a last word. Luke, do you want to say hello? Uh, I sh yeah, I, I will say uh, goodbye. And I will say, uh, hopefully, we'll meet again very soon. Uh, thank you for uh, helping us to build a, a successful G-Scars. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.